Hello and welcome to the Happy Author Podcast with me, Dorothy Coombson. I'm a multi-award winning best-selling author and I'm here to help demystify the publishing world for anyone who writes books, wants to write books or just has a love and passion for books. Today I want to talk to you about rejection. Yes, I know your stomach has probably clenched at the thought of it, but rejection is a huge part of a writer's life, mine included. I'm not sure how much of my story you know, but when I was trying to get published, I was rejected by pretty much every single agent in the Writers and Artists Yearbook and the Writers Handbook twice. My rejection story starts when I was trying to get my first book, The Cupid Effect, published. Everybody will say no to it. Everyone said no to it. I was writing, at the time I started writing The Cupid Effect, I had, I was actually in the middle of writing the book that became The Chocolate Run, which was my second book to be published. And I went to Leeds, I had a night out with a friend, and what happened that night, it was hilarious, we had a really good night out, and I came away inspired to write a story about a woman who turns out to be modern day Cupid. I went back to London, where I was living at the time, and wrote the first three chapters of the book called The Cupid Effect, and I had spelt effect wrong. I spelt it with an A, and I'm telling you that for a reason, because I'll come back to that in a minute. But anyway, I wrote the first three chapters, and I sent it off to agents um, to, to try and get a publishing deal, because at the time, that was what you were meant to do. Write the first three chapters, and send it off, and wait for all the offers from agents of rep- for representation to flood in. And what flooded in for me was rejection after rejection. So I thought, you know, I mean, it was heartbreaking. It was hard to constantly be get a no and to have lots of people point out in quite nasty terms that it was affect with an E, not affect with an A. And I've never forgotten the difference since. So, you know, a good thing came out of that. Um, Anyway, I thought, I really believe in this story. So I'll finish it and try again. So I sat down. I pushed myself to finish writing the whole story and sent it out again. And I was rejected all over again. So I was wondering what to do. So I thought, you know what, I'll open the book up. And I'll send them the pub- the manuscript off to an independent publisher because I had literally nothing to lose. At the time, they used to call um, unsolicited, which means that they didn't come in from agents, um, manuscripts, the slush pile. So I sent it off to the slush pile of an independent publisher that I knew called Piacus. And I knew of them because I reviewed books for a women's magazine back then. And they'd send me copies to write reviews of their books. So I thought I had nothing to lose. So um, I sent the book off to them. And I didn't hear anything back. Not for months. And I was on the verge of giving up hope. And I spoke to my friend and said, you know what, maybe I should be giving up this writing thing. And she kind of reminded me that I couldn't do that. Writing and telling stories is something that is a part of me. It's not something I choose to do. It's something I'm almost compelled to do. So, you know, I kind of got um, reminded of that by my friend. So I often, I moved on to wondering if I should maybe just give up trying to get published because, you know, having rejection after rejection is really difficult and really heartbreaking. So like three months after I'd sent off the manuscript to the independent publisher, I was lying in bed and I was thinking this thing about, you know, do I get, do I give up trying to get published? Do I just keep trying to write my stories for myself? And back then, um, self-publishing wasn't as big a thing as it was, as it is now. Back then, self-publishing, paying to have your own book published was called vanity publishing. And it wasn't something that most people wanted to get involved in. Um, it's not like it is nowadays. Self-publishing nowadays is a whole different thing, whole different ball game, and there are so many different reasons for doing it. But back then, I was thinking maybe I should just give up trying to get published um, and just tell stories. So I was lying in bed and I looked up. 
And I, well, I just looked out there and I was sort of thinking, you know, God, the universe, whoever's out there, can you send me a sign? Should I be giving up trying to get published or should I keep going? And then not long after that, there was a knock on the door and I went down and got a letter from the postman. And because I was reviewing books from, um, for Women's Magazine, as I said, I had this pile of unopened book catalogues and I could feel in this letter that there was a book catalog in it and I thought yeah another another book catalog for the pile and I slung it onto the pile and then I thought actually do you know what I sent my book to them maybe I should open it and see what what they're saying and maybe maybe it might be hearing back about my book and um, obviously it was a good thing that I did open it because in it as well as the book catalogue was an offer for a two book deal so That was my sign. That was my much needed sign that I should keep trying to get published. I have this publishing offer of a two book publishing deal. And from that, I got myself an agent and I got myself an agent by ringing up one of the agents who hadn't been too hideous to me in my, in her rejection letter. I mean, I had some really real stinker rejection letters that are still seared into my brain but anyway um I rang up this lady because she hadn't been too hideous to me she had said in her letter that I was trying too hard to be funny and if I decided to rewrite the book she'll be interested in seeing it again so when I got the offer letter I rang her up and I started asking her about getting tv rights back because the offer letter was for world rights and I knew from researching into getting published that you shouldn't assign world rights to a publisher without getting a substantial amount of money for the world rights. And I'll cover this properly another time. But for an author, selling your books to foreign publishers and having them publish it in their country, in their language, with their cover can be a huge revenue stream for them. Um, my books have been published in 30 language and so every so often I'll get a, a notification from my agent that I've got a tiny bit of money from Macedonia for example or from um, Portugal or from Thailand wherever wherever my books are published so it's something that keeps you ticking that can keep you ticking over so when you're offered a two book deal when you're offered a publishing deal don't rush into it have a look at what they're offering you what they're asking you for and if they are wanting world rights which means that the publisher your UK publisher will then go and sell the rights on across the country across the world so they'll effectively own the rights to it and they'll get the money from the translations if that is the offer then try and negotiate or get your agent to negotiate um, for more money because it could be making if the book takes off which it can do, that could be a substantial amount of money that you're giving to your publisher without getting any proper compensation for it. As I said, I'll cover that properly at another time. But as I was talking to this agent, I rang up this lady and was talking to her about world rights and TV rights because, you know, I I really had nothing to lose by ringing her. Um, she kept laughing and I said to her, you see, I am funny. And um, that was the final thing that made her offer to be my agent, which was like, great, you know, I've got an agent now. I woke up this morning, I had nothing. I didn't have a book deal. I didn't have an agent. But by the 48 hours, I had a book deal and I had an agent. But remember, when you're hearing this story, this was a long time ago. I really doubt many agents will be amenable to getting a call from an unknown random like I was um, at the time, basically asking them questions and asking them for their expertise for free, which was essentially what I was doing. I didn't actually realise that's what I was doing at the time, but I'm mind, more mindful of that sort of thing now. Anyway, she was my agent for my first two books, and then we parted ways before my third book, and I found a new agent who I'm still with 14, 15 years later, and we get on really well. I got on well with my first agent, but I get on really well with my second agent my current agent in a different very different way we are very similar people we talk a lot about all sorts of things he is very different to my first agent and um, we have a very different working relationship 
And again, I'll cover this another time, but working with an agent, you have to be able to get on with them. So I had, at this point, I had two books published. I had an agent, I had a brand new agent who loved my third book, which was My Best Friend's Girl. And going out there again, trying to find a new publisher because I decided to move on from my old publisher. And you think that would be, I'd be set, wouldn't I? Two books published, brand spanking new agent, no more rejection in my life. Right? Wrong. You know, rejection, it's still there. It's still there. And it still came from me. And as I said, my agent loved and believed in my best friend's girl. But nah, lots of rejections from all the publishers he sent it to. Very few people were interested. A couple were kind of lukewarm about it, but not enough to take it any further. Um, so, so here we are again. Dorothy Coombson, two books published and on the rejection pile again. Um, whilst I'm here, let me have a quick side note to mention that in the rejections I received in the first round from the Cupid Effect and then with my best friend's girl, what I heard more than once was that my book wasn't for them because it was about a black woman, but it wasn't about the black experience. That says a lot to me about the state of publishing. You know, for them, it was almost as if they had an idea in their minds about what black people should be writing about. And they weren't going to publish me because what I write about wasn't what they thought I should be writing about. I can guess what they wanted me to write about and expected me to write about. But for them, this was I was something completely different, something they hadn't heard of before and something they weren't willing to explore because, you know, I'm not writing about the black experience. I'm not teaching them anything about what it means to be black or what they think being black is all about. But anyway, let's go back to my agent believing in my book, but no other publishers being interested. One of the rounds of people we sent the book to, who we thought might be interested, she came back and said she wanted to see some more. And I hadn't written that more, much more. I had written more than three chapters, but I hadn't written much more. So she decided she would like to meet me. And that's what I did. I went to meet her and we got on really well. And she really liked the book. And we walked away from that. A few days later, we got a call offering us another two book deal, a two book deal with them, which was fantastic. You know, it's like, oh, it was worth it. It was worth hanging on. There was somebody who would be the right publisher for it. And she was. She was absolutely the perfect publisher for that book and for my next few books. You know, we worked together for quite a while, quite a few years. And then... um she moved on to another publisher and we kind of ended up working together then. But she was, you know, absolutely the right publisher. So here we are. My editor has moved on to another publisher. I'm another publisher. I decide I want to move on to another publisher again. And at this point, what do I have? I have several bestsellers topping the charts across the world, TV deal for one of my books and a whole load of sales stacked up. So this is it. This is the point where I stop being on the rejection pile. I stop experiencing rejection. Yes? Absolutely no. No. Rejection is still there. It's still in my life. I know that this isn't the sort of thing that authors, especially ones who've had more than one book published, talk about because you don't like to admit it. We don't like to admit it. But Success doesn't ever insulate you from rejection. And, you know, it's it's a hard thing to admit, I think, for anybody. But you think you get to a certain level and you don't get treated in a certain way anymore. You don't get rejected anymore. But it happens. I remember when I was wanting to move to different publishers and try something new. And we had meetings set up with a couple of people who I was interested in working with. And... We had all these meetings set up and then one of them rang up to cancel not long before the meeting and they didn't really give a proper reason but it seemed to amount to that the my type of book although it, there were my type of books the books I write were successful and they did well but they weren't what they wanted and you know you kind of at, at the time I didn't realize how even though you've had 
several books published and you've done really well, your books have done really well, yes, still have people who will reject you. I've had several books published since that happened, but, you know, and I can say hand on my heart that I'm grateful I didn't actually even get the chance to meet them because I could have been sucked into working with them and who knows what would have come of that. I am really grateful that I ended up with the publisher I ended up with at the time. They're not my um, current publisher. But you know what? It really stung. At the time, it really stung. It was like another rejection. Shouldn't this be over for me now? But no, apparently no. Um, As I said, I went on to be published by another publisher who were fantastic. I'm not with them anymore, but that's for other reasons. And I did, you know, I did really well. Again, my books did really well with them and it was all fine. But it was still there in the back of my mind. Now I'm like thinking, you know what? Rejection can come for you any time. And it doesn't, have, I don't think that worry ever leaves an author. No matter how many books you've get published, the worry of being rejected doesn't ever leave you. And it's always there. And I know I sound like I'm being pessimistic, but you know, most authors sign a particular number deal books you know you get you sign up with a publisher and it's usually for me it's usually two books I sign two books at a time some people signed three some people sign eight book deals the point of this is that at any point you can then you can escape from them if they're not if they're not who that you thought they were you can write your two books with them and then go see ya I'm off but also they can do the same thing to you and it's always a worry you know that maybe your last book didn't do as well as you hoped Maybe your editor, who was your champion and who was the person who wanted you to be there, has moved on. And the people who are left behind aren't as keen as you used to be. You know, maybe there are internal wrangles you don't know about that have you as a casualty. So any of those things I've just talked about can lead to publisher not renewing your, their contract with you. And, um, and that can be a real blow because, you know, you've worked really hard You've tried your best. You've done everything you can to make this the book, best book ever. And you're still rejected. That hasn't really happened to me, but it can happen. And it's a huge blow. Other ways you can get rejected as a published successful author. Bookshops can reject your book. I've um, recorded for this, for the Happy Author podcast, an interview with a sales director. And they're the people who go from your publishers to bookshops to negotiate getting your books onto the bookshelf because it's not a simple case of you've written a book and it ends up on the bookshelf you have to your publisher has to negotiate for every bit of space to get onto the shop um to the shelves and sometimes just before publication you'll be told you can be told by your publisher that the bookshops aren't interested or they've only just taken 10 copies when they were expecting them to take a thousand copies and some bookshops some supermarkets just go Sorry, we're not interested at this time. And that's another huge rejection, another huge blow. So I know I am sound like I'm being very negative, but I'm rather called it being realistic. And what I'm trying to say is, in case I haven't shown you the bold truth yet, when you're an author, published and successful, bestseller and well-known, the top of what you think you can get to, rejection can still be a part of your life. But wait before you go off and rock in a corner and sort of be jumping at the thought of rejection and potentially around every corner this is the happy author podcast I wouldn't be holding true to the ethos of who I am and this podcast if I didn't try to give you some ideas of how to cope with rejection no matter what stage you're at in your publishing career so come on let's do this let's find ways to deal with rejection number one Allow yourself the space to be upset, heartbroken, hurt, thoroughly dejected by rejection. Whether it's a manuscript you sent to a publisher, an agent who thought you thought, oh, this is the agent for me who decided they didn't want to work with you after all, or not getting a contract renewed. Yes, it's painful, it's hurtful, and it can make you so sad. So allow yourself to, to feel those emotions. If you want to find, I mean, for me, I find writing down those emotions in a scene I may use in a later book helpful and I find it just as helpful to get drunk and rant about it to my husband and to um to rage against the the unfairness of the world but allow yourself to feel that allow yourself the, sp the space and the time to feel that and then number two put yourself out of that space don't allow 
that space of feeling those emotions and the hurt and the pain to go on for too long. You really don't fall into the trap of staying in that place of hurt and upset for too long. It won't help you to move on to doing what you have to do, which is write another book. And if it is, you want to get published, you want to get an agent, you want to get another publishing deal, you have to do it. And to do that, you have to get out of that out of that space of pain. OK, it's hard, but put a lid on it, get to a point and you go, do you know what? I've got to move on from that. And how you do that to move on is number three. Look at what they said when they're rejecting you again. Is there anything you can use in what the, in the rejection and what they said that you might think is valid for me? Sometimes people say, oh, this book isn't for me. Like the woman who said that I was trying too hard to be funny. She was wrong because I wasn't trying too hard to be funny. I am funny. My book was funny. But don't take on wholesale what that person says, but look at it and say, maybe if they say, look, it drags in the middle or it's not for me because the character isn't, um, isn't redeemed by the end. Look at it and see, does the character need redemption? Does the middle drag? Those things, those rejections, those little nuggets in rejection can be helpful. But don't take on board wholesale what they say. If you don't agree, ignore it. Throw it away and remember that the person who rejected you is probably wrong. Look at the amount of people who who rejected me. I mean, like pretty much everybody. And most of them were saying the book wasn't about the black experience, so they weren't going to publish me. So what? So what did, I could have let that sort of made me think, oh, I need to rewrite, rewrite it and put in the stuff that they wanted, although I have no clue what the black experience was. But what I'm saying is look at it honestly, look at the rejection honestly. If it's just them saying it's not for me, then move on, move on, forget about it, get on with the, with the business of getting a book published. So number four, pick yourself up dust yourself off and get out of there. I know it's hard. There's nothing like being rejected by every agent in the book twice to make you cautious about trying again. But you have to do it. If you want to get published, if you want to get another publishing deal, you want to get an agent, try again. We authors, we're sensitive souls. And that's what helps because we we channel all those feelings and that sensitivity into our books. But you have to get up and get out there. And the way you do that is to develop some, number five, develop some resilience. Develop an I'll show you attitude. Obviously, you don't go around telling people I'll show you. But once you've been those rejections or filed them away for the I was rejected by everyone and look how well I've done part of your memoir. Use those rejections as a spur to keep you going. Remind yourself that you can prove them wrong, that you can get published, your story will be told and there is a market out there for your books and for your story. So be resilient, get resilience in that and use it to drive you forward. Use that rejection to drive you forward, to keep going. Number six on how to deal with rejection. I really believe you need to believe in what you're writing. Some people, so many people I know going to writing books because they think it's going to make them famous or they think it's going to make them a load of money. And good luck with that, by the way, because the slog to get anywhere near being able to work right full time or to get your name well known is hard. It is long and it is hard. It's not an easy route at all, but if you're writing for money and fame. Good luck. But being rejected will sting a lot more. And it's also more likely that you'll get rejected because the people who are buying books, the people who are reading the books, the agents and the publishers, they're very much attuned to cynical attempts to cash in on a trend rather than somebody who is genuinely trying to tell a story or trying to do something with a book. And even if they don't cash in on it, believing in what you're writing is what is going to keep you going when all those rejections roll in. I believed in the Cupid effect. I believed in it, even though all those publishers rejected it after the first three chapters. And I believed in my book enough to keep going and to send it to an independent publisher because I believed in that story. If I was just trying to cynically write a 
uh, romantic comedy that everyone else was writing for the same reason, you know, to try and make a quick buck or to try and become famous. I wouldn't have kept going. I would have tried something else. I would have thought, okay, this isn't working. I'll try something else. But I believe in that story. And it's what, as I, I often say to people at events, it's what keeps you going, what keeps you warm when the cold wind of, re- wind of rejection blows towards you. So believe in your story to want the best for it. This is my final point on rejection and how to deal with it. The writer's life is almost designed to be full of rejection. So please try not to let it get you down. Accept that it is part of your world. It is part of the, of your writing life. As a writer, this is going to happen to you. You're going to be rejected at some stage. And if you aren't, woohoo, I'm so pleased for you. But most of us will be rejected at some stage. So don't let rejection or the fear of rejection stop you from doing what you need to do. Don't let it distract you. Don't let it slow you down. Don't let it put you off. Keep at it. Keep trying to tell that story. Keep writing and keep going because you will get there. I hope you'll get there. So that's it. That's my little foray into discussing rejection. I hope you found it helpful. I hope it gave you some hints on how to overcome it if it if it comes knocking on your door. And I hope hearing that I've been through it more than once has made you feel a bit better and has reminded you that it happens to all of us. Just because we don't talk about it doesn't mean it doesn't happen to us. Anyway, so thank you for joining me today on the Happy Author Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts and join me, Dorothy Coombson, on the Happy Author Podcast for everything you've ever wanted to know about the world of books. Keep writing, keep reading, keep happy. Talk to you soon. Bye.